Hello, and welcome to the 80s Movie Podcast. I'm your host, Edward Havens, publisher and editor of FilmJerk.com. Thank you for listening today. If you like what you hear and you haven't done so already, please consider rating and reviewing the show on your favorite podcatching source. While a good review and rating won't increase our chances of being found or being a featured podcast on a podcatcher like Apple or Google or Spotify, it will potentially help increase the odds of someone who does find the show for the first time thinking that clicking play will be a good time investment for them. And it's something you can even do while you're listening to this episode. On this episode, we're going to celebrate the start of the summer movie season with a film franchise that for some time in the 1980s seemed to epitomize the summer movie season. The First Blood series, also known as Rambo. For no apparent reason, he was arrested for no particular crime. I'm starting to dislike you. Lot. They thought they'd found an easy mark. They were wrong. <laughs> Sylvester Stallone. This time he's fighting for his life. First Blood, rated R. Starts Friday, October 22nd at theaters everywhere. But, as always, before we can get to the movies, we need to get to the movies. Rambo was born from the imagination of Canadian-American novelist David Morrell. After graduating from St. Jerome's University in Waterloo, Canada with a B.A. in English in 1966, Morell would begin studying at Penn State, where he would earn his M.A. and Ph.D. in American literature. While studying at Penn State in 1968, he would begin working on his first novel, inspired in part by discussions he would have with a fellow student who had recently returned from fighting in Vietnam. Over the course of three years, even after graduating from Penn State and becoming a teacher at the University of Iowa, Morell continued to work on the book. It told the story of a homeless Vietnam veteran only known as Rambo, who finds himself in trouble with the local police chief when he wanders into a small town in Kentucky. The sheriff, Wilfred Teasel, first drives Rambo to the other edge of town and orders the man not to come back. When Rambo does return, Teasel arrests Rambo and tosses him into the local jail on charges of vagrancy and resisting arrest. Rambo, who suffers from what we now know as post-traumatic stress disorder, has a flashback to his time in the war due to the cramped cell inducing his claustrophobia. Rambo escapes from the jail when the police try to cut his hair and clean him up. He steals a motorcycle and heads into the nearby mountains to hide. Eventually, Teasel learns about Rambo's history and skills thanks to Colonel Sam Troutman, a Green Beret leader who worked with Rambo in Vietnam and has arrived in the small town to try and help Teasel get himself and Rambo out of this situation, with their lives and dignity intact. But neither man, Rambo, or Teasel is willing to do so, and the story ends with the deaths of both men. The character of Rambo was inspired in part by Audie Murphy, a World War II hero who became a movie star in the years after the war, but suffered from undiagnosed PTSD because of his memories of the war and his movie roles, which often forced him to relive situations similar to what happened to him in Italy and France during the war. Murphy could not sleep without a loaded pistol under his pillow, and he would become addicted to sleeping pills in order to get any kind of rest. Publisher Roman and Littlefield released the book in the spring of 1972, and while it wasn't a big seller, Hollywood would take notice of it, as would a 25-year-old creative arts teacher at the University of Maine, who used the book as a teaching tool to his own students as an example of excellent writing. That teacher was Stephen King. Hollywood actually took notice of the book before it was even published. Columbia Pictures, looking to ride the current wave of anti-hero films like Bonnie and Clyde and its own Easy Rider, would purchase the option to make the book into a movie for $75,000, and assigned writer-director Richard Brooks whose 20-year film career included such classics as The Blackboard Jungle, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, Elmer Gantry, and In Cold Blood, to begin adapting the book into a workable screenplay. Brooks would keep the major storyline intact, but made three major changes. He would make Teasel not a veteran of the Korean War, as he is in the book, but of World War II. He would change Colonel Troutman into a psychiatrist, and he would change the ending. Rambo still dies at the end, but the how 
would change. Brooks envisioned Burt Lancaster, or Lee Marvin, as Teasel, and Betty Davis, of all people, to play the psychiatrist, but the project would be put in a turnaround before Brooks could even finish his first draft of the script, in part because he refused to change the ending to let Rambo live. Columbia would sell the screen rights to Warner Brothers in 1973 for $125,000, and Warner's president, John Kelly, saw their number one star at the time, Clint Eastwood, as Rambo. Or maybe Robert De Niro, if Clint wasn't interested. By August 1973, director Martin Ritt, whose movies included such classics as The Long Hot Summer and HUD, was assigned as director. And Ritt would try to get Steve McQueen as Rambo and Burt Lancaster as the sheriff. But by 1975, Ritt was off the project. And Sidney Pollack, whose directing career by this point included such classics as They Shoot Horses, Don't They?, the Way We Were, and Three Days of the Condor, would become the next filmmaker to tackle the project. Celebrated Broadway playwright David Rabe would be hired to write a new script, and Rabe would make two major changes to the story. He would, like Brooks years earlier, completely remove Colonel Troutman from the story, and he would have Teasel be the one who ends up killing Rambo. Pollock and producer Martin Bregman had hoped to get Al Pacino to play Rambo, but he would decline the role after reading Rabe's script, finding it to be more extreme than he would prefer. Pollock and Pacino would leave the project together to make the car racing drama Bobby Deerfield at Warner's instead, and it would be some time before Warner's could attach another director. The Saturday Night Fever duo of director John Badham and star John Travolta flirted with the project for a short time, with George C. Scott being considered for Troutman, and Gene Hackman, or Charles Durning, being considered for Teasel, but Batham would commit to a sexy new version of Dracula at Universal instead, and Travolta would make moment by moment with Lily Tomlin once his commitment to Greece was completed. But one important thing would happen out of this period. A new screenplay by William Sackheim and Michael Cazell which would end up becoming the blueprint for the film that would finally get made. And it would be based on this screenplay that neophyte producer Carter DeHaven would be able to secure a one-year option from Warner Brothers to try and get the film made independently. DeHaven would get a new production company called Cinema Group to commit $10 million to make the movie, with John Frankenheimer, whose credits included the classics The Birdman of Alcatraz, The Manchurian Candidate, and Black Sunday, attached as director. Brad Davis, the star of Midnight Express, was signed to play Rambo, and George C. Scott would finally be cast as Troutman. Before the project could move forward, though, Frankenheimer wanted one small change to the script. He wanted Rambo to live, and Michael Cazell would tweak the script to make this happen. After nearly eight years, it looked like First Blood would finally become a movie. But just a few weeks before the film was supposed to start shooting, Filmways, the distributor who was helping to fund the film, went bankrupt, and all parties involved were released from their contracts. Enter Kuroko Pictures and the team of Andrew Vanya and Mario Pissar, two small-time film promoters who were looking to move into the Hollywood spotlight. They had been keeping track of the First Blood project, which they thought would be great as the first movie Kuroko would produce instead of just buying and selling from around the world. Kuroko would spend $375,000 to buy the movie rights to the book from Warner Brothers, and another $150,000 to Cinema Group for the Sackheim Cazell screenplay, and then a couple million more to lock up Sylvester Stallone to both star as Rambo and to rewrite the script. Stallone would make Rambo more of a hero type instead of a stone cold psycho killer, but he was torn over whether or not Rambo should survive at the end. Stallone would do seven revisions of the sackheim Cazell script between July 1981 and November 1981, where sometimes Rambo would live and sometimes Rambo would die. Canadian director Ted Kotcheff, who was better known as the director of comedies like Fun with Dick and Jane, who was killing the great chefs of Europe and North Dallas 40, would be hired as director, and filming on the $12 million budgeted movie was scheduled to begin in the woods of British Columbia, in November of 1981. Brian Dennehy would star as the local sheriff, Teasel, 
and the legendary Kirk Douglas would be Troutman. But shortly after filming was set to begin, Douglas would have second thoughts about the script and would leave the film. Richard Crenna would be on set to play Troutman only a week after Douglas left. The production schedule would be moved around a little bit, so it didn't lose any time. But that would not be the only major problem with the production. Kotcheff had wanted the location to have a graying, overcast look, but for the first month of production, it would be unseasonably warm and sunny in Canada. You know how they say, be careful what you wish for, for you will surely get it? Kotcheff would get exactly what he wanted, and more. In early 1982, the production would need to shut down for a week, when an extremely strong winter storm would pummel the area with heavy snow. There would be several more times when the production would lose time to the heavy snowstorms, losing about two months total to these shutdowns, and adding nearly $3 million to the cost of making the film. And during one of these shutdowns, someone would break into the storage area where many of the guns were being stored and steal about $50,000 worth of machine guns that had been altered to only shoot blanks. The local superintendent of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police was worried that, according to the prop master, the guns could be easily reconverted back into fully functional assault weapons. While the film was shooting in Canada, Vanya and Kassar were busy in an editing suite with Joan Chapman, who would be making her feature debut as an editor on the film. Putting together an 18-minute promotional reel in order to find an American distributor for the film, with 20th Century Fox and Warner Brothers as their top two preferences. But Fox wouldn't bite, nor would Warner's, who had spent seven years trying to get the film made, or any other major Hollywood distributor. They would then have Chapman put together a 55-minute reel for the film in time for the March 1982 American film market, one of 11 movies Kuroko would be representing at the market, Teased by a two-page ad in Variety in The Hollywood Reporter, featuring a drawing of Stallone wearing what would soon be Rambo's signature bandana, and a tagline that promised, A machine. Programmed to kill. Impossible to stop. A number of foreign distributors would sign up to purchase rights for most of the global territories, but they still couldn't get an American distributor to bite. Warners and Paramount were considering the film, but in the end, Vanya and Kassar would make a deal with Orion Pictures, the independent distributor founded by several former heads of United Artists Pictures in 1979, who had just gotten out of their distribution deal with Warner Brothers by purchasing the distribution apparatus of Filmways, the company who was supposed to help finance and distribute the Frankenheimer version of the movie before they went bankrupt in early 1981. Orion would set an October 22, 1982 release date for the film and would start to promote it with teaser trailers and posters in theaters four months in advance, getting early exposure with trailer placements in front of films like Blade Runner, Conan the Barbarian, Firefox, Megaforce, The Road Warrior, The Thing, and Stallone's own Rocky III. Before the film could get released, though, they needed to figure out the ending. Kotcheff shot two endings for the film, one where Rambo dies at the end and one where Rambo lives. Test audiences watching the film clearly preferred the latter ending, so that would be the one that they would go with. By the time October 22nd rolled around, action film fans were starving for something new. Most of the big movies for the previous two months were movies like E.T., My Favorite Year, and An Officer and a Gentleman. Good movies in their own ways, but very much not action movies. First Blood would smash everyone's expectations for the film, opening in first place that weekend with $6.6 million gross from 901 theaters. The film would stay in first place for its first three weeks of release, and after six weeks, it would still be in the top five with more than $40 million in ticket sales. But when the Christmas movies started to open, movies like Tootsie started to take over the water cooler conversations, And First Blood would start to quickly lose theaters and would be out of most first-run theaters after the first of the year with more than $47 million in tickets sold. The success in America would help drive the success for the film around the world, 
First Blood would set box office records in more than a dozen countries in Europe and Asia, and would gross another $50 million in the rest of the world, which naturally would lead to the desire to make more Rambo movies. Less than a year after having trouble finding an American distributor for First Blood at the 1982 American film market, Andy Vanya and Mario Casar returned to the 1983 AFM with nothing more than a teaser poster for First Blood 2, and a promise to have the final film ready for a Christmas 1984 release. They didn't have a story. They didn't have a director. And they were still secretly negotiating with Stallone to return. But global film buyers didn't care about any of that, with dozens of global distributors committing more than $25 million in purchase deals. Vanya and Kassar were only expecting to budget the new film at $20 million, which means they were already $5 million into profiting off the new film before they even had a story or an American distributor, which is not a bad place to be. But with success also comes the lawsuits. Warner Brothers, Cinema Group, and David Morrell teamed together to file suit against Kuroko, Vanya and Kassar, and their third-party company, Anabias Investments, claiming that they had not been properly paid regarding their profit points over First Blood, concerned about Kuroko's quote-unquote faulty accounting. While they dealt with the lawsuit, Vanya and Kassar started to get the First Blood 2 machine going. They would start negotiating with John Travolta, who had just finished shooting the Saturday Night Fever sequel Staying Alive that Sylvester Stallone directed, to be Rambo's partner in the still undefined story, but Stallone would nix that idea. Kevin Jarre, a struggling screenwriter in 1983 who would later go on to write the scripts for Glory, Navy Seals, Tombstone, and The Mummy, would get an unlikely call from Kuroko to come in and pitch an idea for First Blood 2 to Stallone. Jarre's pitch was simple. Maybe Rambo searches for missing POWs back in Vietnam. Stallone's response? Great, let's do it. Jari's story would find the now-named John Rambo being recruited by Colonel Troutman to return to the very same POW camp he was once held prisoner at, to take pictures of the camp and confirm that there are still American soldiers being held there, nearly a decade after the end of the Vietnam conflict. For this, Rambo will earn a full presidential pardon for what happened three years earlier. Rambo fulfills his part of the deal, but he goes off script when he finds an opportunity to break one of the prisoners out of the camp. Just as Rambo and the POW reach the chopper that will take him back to safety, they are betrayed by the officer in charge of the operation. They are captured by the Vietnam soldiers and return to the POW camp, where Rambo is tortured by Soviet soldiers running the camp with the Vietnamese. With the help of a young anti-communist rebel, Rambo is able to escape the POW camp, where he goes on a one-man rampage against the Vietnamese and Soviet soldiers, and rescues the POWs. While Stallone liked Jarre's story, he didn't feel the neophyte writer was ready to tackle the screenplay. David Geiler, a producer of Alien who had done an uncredited polish on the First Blood screenplay, suggested another newer writer for Stallone to work with someone who had just finished directing his first feature and was going to be writing and directing another movie for Guyler in the near future. James Cameron. It would still be six months before Orion Pictures released The Terminator, and it'd be another year before Cameron would be in England shooting Aliens, so he would use this downtime to punch Kevin Jarry's story into a full screenplay. Cameron's first draft, which was called First Blood, The Mission, would be completed in only two months. Stallone was impressed with the script and the young writer, but he was going to need some changes to make it a Stallone-approved script. So even though Stallone had been busy writing the screenplay for Rocky IV, he would set that aside for a short time and get to work writing a new draft of First Blood 2. Gone would be the tech-savvy sidekick Cameron had given Rambo, while there would be more political ramifications between the clearly conservative Troutman and the more neutral Rambo, or at least what Stallone considered to be a kind of neutrality. He'd also amp up the action, since Cameron's script took nearly 40 pages to get to the first major action set piece, and wrote Rambo's famous speech at the end of the film, 
based on sentiments conveyed to him after the opening of First Blood. First Blood director Ted Kotcheff, depending on who you ask, either declined to come back to direct the film or was not asked to come back. Either way, Stallone knew who he wanted. George P. Cosmatos was a Greek-Italian filmmaker who had made a few somewhat popular movies in Europe, like The Cassandra Crossing and Escape to Athena, and had recently made his Hollywood studio debut with the Peter Weller-starring horror film Of Unknown Origin. While that film was not much of a hit in America, Stallone was impressed enough with Cosmatos' style to ask him to direct First Blood 2. Filming on the $25 million movie was scheduled to begin in Thailand in June of 1984, and Stallone would spend the first six months of the year getting himself into the best shape of his life, which would also change the direction of his acting career for the next two decades. But, depending on who you spoke to, the film would end up shooting in Mexico instead, either because Stallone couldn't coexist with the insect-laden Asian terrain, or because it was going to be cheaper to shoot a lot closer to home. Either way, the very first thing they would shoot when production began was a short teaser trailer that could be attached to Rhinestone, Stallone's musical comedy with Dolly Parton that would be opening in theaters in just two weeks. An oiled-up Stallone is seen getting ready for battle, wrapping his chest and arms with straps of ammo, before the camera zooms in on Stallone's face. Rambo is back, intoned the narrator. In Rambo, First Blood, Part 2. I'm not sure if putting a trailer for what obviously was going to be an R-rated action film in front of a family-friendly PG comedy film was the best idea, but the few Stallone fans who would show up were jazzed to see Rambo was coming back, even if it wouldn't be for another 11 months. Principal photography on the film would last for two months, but a skeleton second unit crew would remain in Mexico for another four months, setting up and executing special stunt sequences that would not require the presence of the star. Sadly, one of these stunts, featuring a fireball explosion on top of a waterfall, would end up killing one of the special effects artists when he slipped on a rock and fell down the waterfall. The film would be dedicated to Cliff Wagner Jr. Despite First Blood being one of their most successful movies to date, Orion would pass on releasing Rambo, so Kuroko would open bidding on the film to every studio in town. Columbia Pictures' new sister outfit, TriStar Pictures, would win the rights to release the film, and would set a May 22, 1985 release date. Along with the Richard Pryor comedy Brewster's Millions and the latest James Bond movie A View to a Kill, they would be the films that started the 1985 summer movie season. A View to a Kill would open in 1,583 theaters and gross $13.3 million in its first weekend, the best opening ever for a Bond movie. Brewster's Millions would gross $9.85 million from 1,521 theaters. Rambo would gross $25.5 million from 2,074 theaters. That 2,074 theaters would set a new exhibition record for the widest opening release, the previous record being Beverly Hills Cop, which played on 2,010 screens a year and a half earlier. And that $25.5 million opening weekend gross would be the third highest in movie history, after Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom's $33.9 million in 1984 and Return of the Jedi's $30.5 million in 1983. TriStar knew they would have a hit on their hands. A joint venture between Columbia Pictures, the CBS Television Network, and the HBO Cable Channel, TriStar would time the release of their first IPO to the opening of Rambo, and would sell 2.5 million shares of stock on the first day. It might have only been 11.8% of the company, but it would be the first time in years that the general public could purchase shares in a movie company. Over the course of the summer of 1985, many of the movies released would not succeed with audiences. Joe Dante's wonderful sci-fi comedy Explorers, his follow-up to Gremlins, would cost $25 million to make and only gross $9 million. 
Toby Hooper's Life Force, a $25 million adaptation of the cult sci-fi novel Space Vampires, would only sell $11 million in tickets. The sexy John Travolta, Jamie Lee Curtis drama Perfect would barely gross half of its $25 million budget, but that would be better than Disney's $28 million return to Oz, which could only muster $11 million in ticket sales. Three similarly themed science movies, Weird Science, Real Genius, and My Science Project, would open within seven days of each other and all three would bomb. Disney's animated division, which could usually be counted on for a hit film, would miss hard on their very expensive dark fantasy film, The Black Cauldron. Two westerns, Silverado and Clint Eastwood's Pale Rider, would quickly be sent packing. The biggest films of the summer would, like 1984, be two Steven Spielberg productions, The Goonies and Back to the Future. Rambo would not only be the second most successful film of the summer with $150 million in tickets sold, after Back to the Future's $210 million, it would be the second highest grossing film for the entire year, even beating Rocky IV. And Rambo would earn another $150 million from the rest of the world. Naturally, development on First Blood 3 would begin immediately, while Stallone fulfilled his two-picture deal with Canon Films. The first of those films, Cobra, would be directed by George P. Cosmastos. Kuroko wanted a bigger scope for First Blood 3 and would hire Harry Kleiner, whose credits over the previous 30 years included Steve McQueen's Bullet, Fantastic Voyage, and the screen adaptation of Oscar Hammerstein's stage musical Carmen Jones to take a first pass, but Stallone didn't like that draft, for reasons never disclosed. Through contacts at Canon, Stallone would get to know Sheldon Lettich, who had just turned in a script to Golan and Globus called Bloodsport. That was going to be the first major starring role for Jean-Claude Van Damme. And Stallone would have Lettich take a pass at First Blood 3. Lettich would come up with a story that would send John Rambo from Thailand, where he was fighting underground stick-fighting competitions in order to help restore a monastery, to Afghanistan to help rescue Colonel Troutman after Rambo opts out of trying to help the Afghan Muhadin repel the Soviet army. Now, in 2022, we have the hindsight of knowing that the Muhadin of 1987 would eventually morph into the Taliban of the 90s and 2000s, but such is the problem of trying to tie a movie into then-current events. Sylvester Stallone, who had defeated the Soviets not only in First Blood 2, but also in Rocky IV, loved the idea of going after Mother Russia once again, although it was his wish to see a Rambo movie move away from being less of a cartoon character and more of a realistic figure. Probably because there had been a 65-episode animated Rambo series in 1985 and 1986, which had had action figures and coloring book tie-ins for children. But to ensure the action on screen was as big as possible, Stallone would ask Vanya and Kassar to hire Russell Mulcahy, the music video director responsible for several of Duran Duran's most lavish videos, and had recently directed the worldwide hit film Highlander. The budget for First Blood 3, which would soon be renamed Rambo 3, would be $45 million, triple the budget of the first film and nearly double the budget of the sequel, in large part because Stallone would be paid $16 million this time around as star and screenwriter. The film would begin production in Israel in late August of 1987, but would hit a snag two weeks into production when Stallone and Mulcahy would start butting heads on practically everything having to do with how the film was being made. Vanya and Kassar, whose company had practically been made on the back of Sylvester Stallone, would back their star. Mulcahy and cinematographer Rick Waite would leave the production, and the producers and star would spend several days going over a list of potential replacement directors before settling on Peter McDonald, a camera operator and second unit director whose credits included A Bridge Too Far, the first two Superman movies, Labyrinth, and First Blood 2, and was already working the second unit on this movie. It would be McDonald's first effort as director. Once McDonald was on board, filming would start back up and move from Israel to Thailand, 
where McDonald would himself shoot the entirety of the stick fighting sequence with a handheld camera to Yuma, Arizona before finishing principal photography at the end of January of 1988. McDonald would only have four months to finish the film's post production, as the movie was locked in for a May 25, 1988 release. The film was expected to be so big. Kiroko and TriStar Pictures had opened up bidding for the film while they were still shooting it. One theater chain, United Artist Theaters, was so gung-ho on locking up the film for their best locations in Los Angeles, New York City, and other major cities, they would bid 110% of their ticket sales for some of their best-performing theaters like the Cornet Theater in Westwood and the Criterion in New York City's Times Square. Meaning if Rambo had sold, say, $63,000 worth of tickets the first weekend at the Cornet, United Artists would actually have to pony up $69,300 in rental fees just to play it. Now, most theaters in major cities like Los Angeles and New York City would bid in the 80 to 90% rentals range because theaters make most of their money on popcorn, candy, and soda sales. But bidding 110% means you're going to have to give away part of your concession sales too. The movie would not only need to be a big hit, but moviegoers would really need to spend big at the snack bar as well. Now, remember a few moments ago when I said the budget for Rambo 3 was $45 million? When the movie started production, it was $45 million, but with the production delays due to the firing of Mulcahy and several other members of his production team, and the extended production schedule and additional footage needed to be shot by Peter McDonald, the final budget would end up being $58 million, which would make Rambo 3 the most expensive movie ever made to that point, unadjusted for inflation. It had been 10 years since Richard Donner's $55 million Superman movie had overtaken the previous record holder, 1963's Cleopatra. But Rambo would only hold that dubious record of the most expensive movie released to theaters for a grand total of 28 days. When the $58.16 million Who Framed Roger Rabbit was released. Along with Crocodile Dundee 2, Rambo 3's opening on May 25th would signify the official start of that summer movie season. But Rambo 3 would not be the number one movie in the nation on its opening weekend, unlike its two predecessors. Its $16.75 million opening would only be good enough for second place nearly $8 million less than Dundee. In its second week, Rambo would lose 54% of its audience and come in third, behind both Dundee and the Tom Hanks movie Big. In its third week, it would fall all the way to sixth place, barely earning more than half of what Rambo 2 had made in the same time frame three years earlier. TriStar and Kuroko went into damage control, giving an interview with Variety's Richard Gold, assuring readers that not only was Rambo 3 not going to be a bomb once it opened internationally, but there would, and I quote, absolutely be a Rambo 4. The headline for the article read, TriStar Kiroko Execs Insist Rambo 3 Won't Die at Box Office. But the header for the continuation of the article deeper in the issue was a far more accurate statement. It simply read, Rambo 3 in Box Office Retreat. Now, to be fair, Kuroko and TriStar weren't exactly wrong on either of their major statements. Rambo 3's international success would save the film. It would gross more than $135 million overseas, which helped offset the $53.7 million domestic gross and put the film into a small but still profitable margin. But whether it was general indifference to the film mirroring real-life happenings half a world away, or the film being named the most violent movie ever made by the Guinness World Records, there was definitely a cooling for enthusiasm for another Rambo movie. And, as you probably know, there would be another Rambo movie, but it would take another 20 years before it was made. Neither Kuroko, who went bankrupt in 1995 after a series of expensive flops like Showgirls and Cutthroat Island, couldn't overcome the successes of Terminator 2, Basic Instinct, and Cliffhanger, nor TriStar Pictures, which in the late 1990s would become a more genre-centric label for anime, 
action and horror films with the occasional prestige picture would be involved in the production or distribution of the fourth movie. That movie, simply titled Rambo, would take Rambo 3's world record as the most violent movie ever made. And like Rambo 3, it would not open to first place at the American box office. Coming in second to the lame Jason Friedberg and Aaron Seltzer parody, Meet the Spartans. And like Rambo 3, it would not be as successful as its predecessors, grossing only $113 million in total around the world, with just $42 million of that coming from America. It would be followed 11 years later by what is currently the final Rambo movie, 2019's Rambo, Last Blood. This time, Rambo went up against the Mexican drug cartels. At one point, Stallone would work with David Morrell, the creator of the Rambo character, to come up with a different storyline for the fifth movie, which would have been the first time Morrell would have been directly involved with the writing of one of the movies based on his most famous creation. But the company who owned the rights to the character rejected the script that they had written. It would be released into theaters in September of 2019, and like Rambo 3 and Rambo, it grossed far less than the previous film, earning just $91.5 million worldwide against an $80 million production and advertising budget. And once again, it would be heavily criticized for its ultra-violent imagery. David Morrell would be especially harsh on the film, calling it soulless and cheap, and saying that he felt less of a human being for having seen it. But apparently, Stallone didn't get the memo that fewer and fewer people were seeing every subsequent Rambo film since 1985. While promoting the film, he would, despite the title of the movie being Last Blood, express an interest in Rambo taking refuge at an Indian reservation after his final battle with the cartels, while also stating he was considering a plan for a series of prequels, exploring John Rambo as a teenager before he headed off to Vietnam. If you've noticed, I haven't given any critical evaluation to any of the movies, and there's a specific reason for that. I've never seen any of the Rambo movies outside of the original 1982 First Blood film, which I thought was a very well-made movie with a pretty good performance from Stallone probably his second best after the original Rocky. But I've never been interested in most of the movies he's made. I've only seen about 15 or so of the movies he's ever appeared in, and two of those are superhero movies, one where he only appears at the very end, and the other where he's in a good portion of the movie, but he only provides the voice of a CG animated character. And that, my friends, was a brief history of the First Blood movies. Thank you for joining us. Please note that our next episode, episode 78, will be released in three weeks on June 12th, as I will be taking a short vacation with my wife next week to New York City, and I do not plan on working during my vacation. Remember to visit this episode's page on our website, filmjerk.com, for extra materials about the movies we've covered on this episode. The 80s Movie Podcast has been researched, written, narrated and edited by Edward Havens for idiosyncratic entertainment. Thank you again. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>